Hey everyone, it's Simi Shaw, and welcome to Trailblazers. On this podcast, I dive deep into the journeys of trailblazing South Asians, sharing the stories of the leaders and dreamers lighting the way across the South Asian diaspora. Before I jump into today's episode, I want to spend a second and tell you guys about the newly launched Trailblazers Agency and Expert Network. At South Asian Trailblazers, we've long been dedicated to elevating and convening extraordinary leaders through our media platform and our community-wide events. Our agency and expert network is simply the next step toward fulfilling that mission. We're forging impactful collaborations between exceptional leaders and visionary organizations. If you're part of a company or organization looking for fresh and diverse voices to speak at your next summit, conference, or event, or represent you in a new brand campaign, please get in touch. If you're looking for someone to offer you expertise on a project that you're working on, reach out and we can plug you into our expert network of trailblazers across industries. And finally, if you're a speaker or a leader looking to connect with companies who want to share in your expertise, feel free to reach out. You can learn all about us at southasiantrailblazers.com slash trailblazers dash agency. And with that, let's jump into our episode. Deepa Bueller Kosla is a new age digital celebrity breaking barriers across industries. Deepa is not only one of the first Indian influencers to gain international renown, but is also a founder, model, public speaker, and activist with a following of over 1.9 million people. Deepa first left India at the ripe age of 18 and moved to Amsterdam to study international human rights law. She later moved to London to pursue her master's degree and interned at both the United Nations International Criminal Court and IMA Influencer Agency, one of the biggest influencer agencies in Europe at the time. That experience inspired her to take the leap into digital and social media. Today, Deepa has been featured on the covers of seven international magazines, including Vogue and Condé Nast. She's walked at Cannes and the Venice Film Festivals and has also been an ambassador for brands like Pandora, Estee Lauder, and Carastas by L'Oreal. Deepa is also a serial founder. She previously founded the nonprofit Post for Change to rally influencers to harness the power of social media and actively address social and global issues like colorism. Her newest entrepreneurial endeavor is inspired by her mother's work as an Ayurvedic doctor and her own personal decade-long battle with skincare. She's transforming the skincare industry with her brand, Indie Wild, which combines Ayurvedic rituals with revolutionary science-backed chemistry. Today, Deepa lives between Amsterdam and India with her husband, Oleg, and their daughter, Dua. As many of you know on Trailblazers, it's a rare occasion for us to host a global influencer. But Deepa has broken incredible barriers across industries and has really shown us what the gamut of being an influencer can mean with respect to building an empire and having an impact. Deepa, for all the reasons I just stated and many more, it's an honor and a privilege to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining me on South Asian Trailblazers. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. So I'm curious, you have built such an incredible journey and career and brand. And it all started when you left India at the age of 17 and you moved to Amsterdam to study law. Can you tell me a little bit about your early aspirations and how they were shaped by your upbringing in India and your decision to move to Europe at such a formative age? So to begin with my early days, born and raised in India, two Punjabi parents and, you know, just had a very regular Indian upbringing. And the thing that was different though, was that my dad had started a, they had like a bit of a small manufacturing business and they started doing business in the Netherlands and hence the Dutch connection. And so when I finished school, it was 
pretty clear if you wanted to study abroad, it would only be the Netherlands. But the uni that I wanted to go to was pretty expensive. So I had to apply for a scholarship and all that good stuff, but finally made it. And I think Now that I'm 32, it is, well, 33, actually, I just turned 33. It is such a beautiful combination of half my life being very Indian, Indian in my upbringing, life, thinking, and half my life being a bit more of a global citizen and an expat. And I think that combination has truly made me, me. And now that I have a little daughter who's truly a halfie, yeah. being somebody who can appreciate so many different cultures is just such a boon and such a blessing in disguise and I wouldn't have it any other way. So I'm very grateful that I could have that experience of being a true Indian girl at heart, but also having that global exposure. Absolutely. And it's interesting because I do feel like even as I've witnessed your rise, and I think many in our community have, we have really seen that global persona really emanate in all the work that you do. I'm curious... Obviously, you moved from India to Europe at a young age with this intention of studying, and I would guess, pursuing law longer term. And mm-hmm. then I know you also did an internship at one of the first influencer marketing agencies in Europe. Can you talk to me about those early career goals and the internship that ultimately sparked your interest in potentially pivoting careers? Yeah, that was a real interesting one. My entire life, I have been somebody who's quite goal-oriented. So this one came as a bit of a curveball because in my planning, I was very ready to be a lawyer and I finished from my bachelor's and then I was about to go to London to do my master's. And I had about a six months break where my brother introduced me to somebody who had a fashion agency. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, why not? I've been so academic for so long. Let's do something in another one of my interests, which is the world of fashion and beauty. And then when I started the internship, I very soon realized, wait, this is not a normal agency. It is actually an influencer agency. And I had no idea what the term even meant. I literally was like, what is happening? What is Instagram? Why are these girls? (laughs) And when I say girls, I mean, Kiara Ferragni and like Ami Song and like these OG creators. I'm like, why are these girls getting paid so much money by brands? Hold up. What is this world? And then in my day three, I closed this really big deal with Mango, the fashion brand for Kiara Ferragni. And I'm like, oh my goodness, the media landscape is about to change. This is crazy. The power is going to the people and it's a democratization of media and beauty and fashion. And I could kind of see it from a little bit of a futuristic ball. And at that moment, I reached a crossroads and I'm like, wait, do I do this? I don't see any other South Asian doing it globally in the fashion industry on Instagram. I think I could do it. Also the impact it could have in form of followers and reach and just truly being able to talk to young minds, I think could be massive. And on the other side, it was human rights law. I'm like, or I could do that. And ultimately, still strive for the same impact and the same thing, but maybe it would take me a lot longer to get there. And let's also be honest, being a young 21-year-old, the way influencers showed their life and their trips, of course, also made a difference. Could I stay in those hotels and do those things? (laughs) So it was a combination of many things together. But ultimately, I had the very difficult conversation with my mom, where I was like, Mom, I don't think I'm going to become a lawyer. I know... We've spent a lot of time and effort and money on it. But trust me on this, my gut says I need to go this way. And as you can imagine, that was very hard for an Indian mom to accept. But she trusted me and she said, all right, I'll give you one year, girl. If you in one year can do this and like prove it to me, then go for it. And if not, you're going straight back to law. And I was like, "Okay, fair game. And that was the year I probably worked the hardest in my entire life. I started from zero and built it all up. Wow. Now, I'm curious. I mean, obviously, this was the early days of influencer culture and Mm -hmm. Instagram. We've seen Mm -hmm. the market get a lot more saturated in recent years. What gave you conviction that this was something that you could do and succeed in? I think crazy self-belief in yourself, definitely, in knowing you can figure it out, in knowing that you have the emotional intelligence to network, to read a room. Like it was a lot of obviously belief, like with any form of risk you take, whether it's today with Indeval as a business or 
back then with taking this leap of faith in a new platform, it was a lot of, do I think I can do it? And ultimately, I think the curiosity of what it could be was just so much greater. And the thing is, I always say, I never started this career as a hobby. I know a lot of girls did, and then it became something bigger. For me, it was very clear from the beginning. It had to be strategic decisions. I don't do things if I don't think I could be one of the best in. There's no point for me personally to try it out. And so for me, I had to give it my best shot and do it the best way I could. So I think that really, really helped. And of course, being in an influencer agency, I got to see it from both sides. So having that inside intel was absolutely invaluable. Of course, the contacts I had with brands at the agency, I could then use for myself for collaborating with other influencers that I'd met through the agency and things like that really helped in the early days. I'm curious, you said that you never start anything that you know that you can't be the best at. And to that end, you've leveraged a lot of the work that you've done thus far to be a builder. I know you launched Post for Change, now Into Wild. Can you talk a little bit about the decisions to launch these platforms? And again, what gave you the conviction that you could be one of the best? Post for Change was the most genuine, authentic piece of my heart. I think being an Indian girl, seeing the inequalities growing up, that was something that was just a no-brainer to create a NGO that creates a ripple, no matter how small or big, to help in that equality of gender. And so Post for Change was something when I met my now husband, Oleg, he was a diplomat fighting for women's rights. So it became almost like our personal conviction of our love to help the world around us because we're in such a privileged position to be able to do so. Me with my following and him with his network and connections in the world of UN agencies and NGOs. So Post for Change was really that labor of love. We're like, okay, we got to do something because we know we can create some form of an impact. Little did we know that impact would come in the form of doing a campaign with UNICEF and reaching 110 million people in our first campaign. Like it was insane. But Post for Change is something I would want to continue doing for the rest of my life if I can. So it's not one of those projects, but it's really something that we want to continue the fight until truly there's equality in the world. And then in the wild is, again, I think a destiny brand. So many things came together for that one to happen. It was a combination of my mom being a dermatologist and Ayurvedic doctor, so me growing up in that world my whole life, combined with me struggling with acne and then truly solving it because of the combination of clean Ayurvedic ingredients with clinical chemistry ingredients putting them together was a white space in beauty that didn't exist at the point. And then thirdly, just my evolution as a content creator wanting to do something next. And so when all those things came together around the pandemic, and I was also pregnant at that point, thinking more towards what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want to leave back? And India Wild was the answer to all of those things. And we launched in October, 2021. And it's going to be soon two years old only, which is crazy. Wow. And I've been working on it for 10 years, <laughs> but it's going to be <laughs> two years old soon. And yeah, that's how that started. Well, happy early two-year anniversary of Thank Indo you. Wild. I love this idea of creating a legacy. I'm curious, in the past decade, we've seen influencers launching brands that resonate with their values and their communities and audiences become a lot more popular. And in that vein, to your point, Ayurvedic inspired skincare and beauty was a relative white space in the last number of years. But even on TikTok, we've seen the trends towards people often anglicizing or whitewashing a lot of these trends that our parents and our ancestors grew up with. What do you see as Into Wild's point of differentiation? And what were you thinking when you decided to launch the brand? Okay, so for me, it's Pretty clear, and I think you will get what I mean with this. Every South Asian in the world has a very clear friction point. And the friction point is on the one hand, we love our mothers, our grandmothers, our culture, our weddings, our food. We love where we come from. At the same time, we're not our mother and grandmother. We want to be financially independent. Yes, we believe in the moon and the stars. We also believe in science and facts. We're financially independent. We want to marry who we want to marry. We want to make our choices. And that friction point is something we just live with on a daily basis. It's yes, we're that. And yes, we're that. 
And you will find this in a woman in Toronto, Canada, in New York City, in Mumbai, in Bangalore. It's yeah. that same friction point. And in the wild is a embodiment of that friction point in a bottle. It is on the one hand, turmeric and ashwagandha, everything your mom and grandmom said, you got to use in your skin because it helps you. At the same time, it's clinically backed. And it's with that vitamin C that the dermats tell you is fantastic for you. And it is us in a bottle. And that I think is me as a person and so many modern South Asians as well. So we're not targeting the 40 plus. We're really targeting the Gen Z and the late millennials who are those women who fit into this category who if they walk by a Sephora and see a brand that has turmeric, but also has niacinamide, they're like, ooh, I like that. That's me. And subconsciously, you make that decision of that's me by just seeing those two ingredients sitting together. And I think that's perhaps the reason for our insane success in the last two years. But yeah, I feel very seen in a product that's not just representing me by showing my turmeric, but it's representing me truly by showing also that friction point that I have within the turmeric and the niacinamide together. Yeah, I'm smiling because that resonates so much in that, yeah, I I do feel like sometimes we are all this living embodiment of East meets West and old meets Mm -hmm. new and tradition meets modern. And I love that you encapsulated that so beautifully. And that's the ethos of your brand. A lot of people, when they start something, they'll start something and then they're going and searching for product market fit. They're going and looking for that audience and those customers to buy. You obviously being an influencer have the reverse scenario where you already have a platform and community and now you're launching something ideally catered to them. Mm. What have been the advantages of that approach and what have been the challenges? Well, good question. It's almost a curse and a blessing in one. Being an influencer brand when I launched was almost a curse because there were so many out there that people started not taking us seriously. It was like, okay, here we go. Another day, another celebrity brand. And you almost had to fight twice as hard to show credibility. And you're like, yeah, 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 I have that. But it's not just me taking a white label product and putting my name on it and saying, look, buy it. There's true R&D behind it. There's true credibility and expertise. So I almost had to like say that a lot more than I feel like any other brand would have to, uh, who would be taken more credible on face value. So that was, I guess, the con. And the pro is obviously the most incredible community that trusted me. That trust is something that I would be so grateful for because when we launched on 19th of October, 2021, I remember that day so clearly because that was a moment of so many months of work coming together. And I'm like, this is it. We're going to put the website live and it might be nothing. It could just be crickets because people are like, why would I buy from this random girl? And we launched it and the trust that people had in us, the first one minute, it was like 8.01 PM and there were already 150 checkouts. I'm like, how do people check out that quickly? How do you put in your hard details in one minute? And it was wild. In our First month, we did our revenue of the first year, everything from there, like we fundraised and just trajectory went crazy. But again, it's because somehow in something I said or something I've done in the last few years, a certain group of people were like, I trust that girl. I think she'd do the best. It resonated. Yeah. The story connected with them, the trust that I would put out there for them connected with them. And I'll forever be so grateful for our community to do that and to believe in us. Yeah. I love that. I want to double click on this because you mentioned it. It sounds like the early process involved, to your point, a lot of R&D, a lot of fundraising, a lot of branding. Can you talk about that early process and some of the things that surprised you despite the fact that you're a serial entrepreneur? What I really underestimated in the earlier days was operations and logistics. I didn't even know what that word meant, truly. But now it's one of our biggest things. One of the most important things at the spine of the entire organization is making sure stuff gets to where stuff needs to get to. It almost sounds so, yeah, duh, but it's like one of the hardest things to do. It's almost like artistic. If a person can do it right, the head of operations is almost an artist to figure out inventory and figure out how much you're going to need and figure out how people are going to react and make sure everything is everywhere on time. So that was something I very much underestimated. Fundraising, surprisingly, because I don't have a finance background, neither does my co-founder and husband. We don't have finance background, but fundraising was an 
absolutely incredible experience. And I know it sounds so interesting coming from a woman of color saying this, because most often you hear it was so difficult. Da, da, da. Yeah. In my head, I never went into any conversation feeling less than. I knew what an insane proof of concept we had. I knew like our first quarter was incredible. I almost went into every conversation being like, you're going to be lucky if you invest in us. And wow. it was we learned so much and more than 70, 80% of our cap table is women. And so with women investing in our business made it such a joyful experience to be a woman of color in 2021 and then 2022 again, to be able to fundraise. And that's almost become a personal mission of mine. I want to spread that great experience more with women to be like, you don't have to be afraid going out there and fundraising because it's really not that scary. And if I can do it, you can do it. Yeah. It's so funny. Every time you talk, I just see this very clear intersection point. Yes, you're goals driven, but you are all mission driven. I think that's a very unique combination to have, particularly in the world we exist in today. And I want to spend a second on this because I imagine a very exciting moment for you was getting into wild red carpet accreditation at Cannes this year. And I know that it had been sort of a wild ride because you'd attended multiple years in a row, but then suddenly didn't have the opportunity to come with the brand that you'd come with previously. What was it like to do that, especially to go from attendee to host and also have the opportunity to uplift other South Asians in the space on this international stage? In a word, it was wild. You know, sometimes if you get pushed back, it almost gives you the fuel to do things differently, to do things you wouldn't have even put on your goals before. So when I got declined and I realized the reason was because I had created a beauty brand at that moment in my sorrow, I had to pick yourself up and be like, okay, you know what? If I got declined from another beauty brand, why not in a while become the beauty brand that takes other people and becomes more inclusive and becomes that brand that takes South Asians on the red carpet. And from that, everything in this entire planet starts off with an idea. And it's a crazy idea. Sometimes you're like, how this little old in their world ever going to get red carpet accreditation at Cannes? And then if there's enough conviction and power behind it, you just figure out a way. And it was, of course, a lot of calling my network that I built over the last many years, figuring out how to apply for accreditation, figuring out how to do this entire thing of how does L'Oreal do it? How does L'Oreal book the cars? What agency do they use to book the cars for the red carpet? Like all of it is just, if there's enough conviction, you'll figure out a way. And I think that was a testament of when it all came together. I remember being on the plane back from Cannes back to Amsterdam, just being like, holy shit, did we just pull that off? Did that just happen? <gasps> did it well just take people on the red carpet? And yeah, it's still such a pinch me moment that we managed it. Will we do it every year? I don't know. It was very stressful, but maybe we'll do it every second year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's an amazing accomplishment. And hats off to you because I think a lot of the community felt so seen. And, and to that end, it's so clear that your broader identity has had an impact on your career journey for so long. I'm curious what it's been like having the ability to collaborate with other South Asians, particularly women in all the work you're doing. I think collaborating with other South Asian women is something I've done from the beginning of my career. And it's something that I truly love because human beings, all of us are social animals. The whole point of our existence is being together, collaborating together, and especially being able to show our audiences that, that we are stronger together and that the pie is big enough for everyone is, yeah. I think, how the future generations should look at it. So for me, it's a no-brainer. Even when I meet fellow beauty founders, we're constantly sharing tips and tricks with each other. It's not a pie is all for me because it is truly the world is big enough for everyone to succeed. Yeah, I respect that a lot. I am curious. There is often this constant pressure I find to adapt and fit new trends, especially in a market that's increasingly saturated, both from the social media perspective and I imagine in the realm of beauty and skincare brands. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that pressure and how do you think about that with respect to staying up to date while also living in the public eye? honest answer to that question is it's work in progress. I don't think I figured it out yet. 
also the last eight years of my life have been in front of the public eye. And I'm constantly figuring out what to share, how much to share, how much to keep private. Honestly, it's just really, truly work in progress. So I guess I'll let you know when I figure it out. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I appreciate you sharing that because I think a lot of people can see someone on the journey you've been on and think that she has it figured out. And so I appreciate your candor with respect to that. And to that end, you do wear a lot of these hats. You're an influencer, you're a model, you're a public speaker, you're a founder, you're a mom, you're a wife, you're a daughter. How do you navigate all these different hats that you juggle? And what advice do you have for people who are also trying to pursue careers as multi-hyphenates? I think the number one rule of all of this is prioritization. You truly have to prioritize because if you don't, you're not going to be able to do anything perfectly well. So I think it's about truly knowing what are the things that are going to help you long term. And those are the things that need your focus and priority and the others have to be shelved for the moment. So even though I wear so many hats, it's truly, I like batch them. So it's moments that if you're working, just focus on work. And then the next moment is dua time. It's all about dua time. And it's truly prioritizing. And the priorities will keep evolving over life. Being a creator and a model was a lot more important a few years ago, while right now it is truly more about in the wild, post for change and dua. And perhaps in the future, it's also going to evolve into something else. So it's truly about figuring out what your priorities are in that phase of your life. Yeah, that's super helpful. And I think very telling about the way the world has evolved in terms of very few of us are holding singular titles in the world that we exist in, both professionally and personally. Absolutely. I'm curious, if you were to look back at the arc of your journey thus far, what would you say to the 17-year-old Deepa who was moving from India all the way to Amsterdam? Oh, man. It's a good question. I think I would say to her, you'll figure it out. Don't worry. She would worry a lot about how the future would be. She would worry about failure. She'd worry about, will people like her? And I think the Deepa of 33 today, I'm so in love with who I am that it took a lot of work to get here. And I think I would tell the 7 year old Deepa, don't worry, you're going to figure it all out. Just hang in there and believe in yourself. Yeah, clearly she did figure it out. The last question I have for you today is what can we look forward to seeing next from you? What's next? My real three focuses are in a world and post for change and obviously my family. But I think you can see a lot of exciting things happening in both those domains of mine. And there's a lot coming up in the next few months already, specifically in India World. The goal is just to make a truly global beauty brand that's very loved. And so we're going to step by step try to get there. Incredible. Well, Diva, thank you so much for taking the time. It's so wonderful to hear about your journey and also to have the ability to share in your insights. Thank you, Simi. Such a pleasure and good luck with everything you're doing with South Asian Tail Blazers. I wish we had podcasts like this when I was 17, 18 to listen to, but thank you for all the good work you're doing and good luck with everything. Thanks for joining us for today's episode. If you want to get new episodes straight to your inbox, subscribe to our newsletter at SouthAsianTrailBlazers.com and follow us at South Asian Trailblazers on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn.